Welcome and thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm Dana Goldman. I'm the Dean of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy. And today we're going to be talking about what it would take to have a more productive political dialogue in America. How we can kind of stop shouting at each other across the political aisle and start listening to one another. And I can't think of two better people uh, to talk about that with than our two guests, uh, Joe, Joe Grogan and Wendell Primus. Uh, if they ha can have a polite, civil conversation, and I know they have, then anyone can. Um, I, I was, rather than my introducing you, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves. So, Wendell, could you mind starting? Uh, well, first of all, let me thank you for uh, inviting me to your campus, to the fourth-ranked uh, uh, football team in the country, much to my <laughs> son's dismay. Uh, he goes to Tennessee, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I grew up on a small farm in, in Iowa, got hooked on economics. Uh, we tested as a graduate student uh, Milton Friedman's idea of a guaranteed annual income and what it would do to labor supply. I went to teach at Georgetown. And that's when I started to work on the Hill for someone named Tom Foley, who later became speaker on the food stamp program. Uh, and then I had a 15-year sojourn with the Ways and Means Committee uh, the committee that has jurisdiction over the entire tax code and a good part of the Social Security Act. Uh, then I went to the Clinton administration, resigned over welfare reform, uh, worked for a think tank for a while, and then came to work for the speaker in 2005. And it's, uh, we've had, uh, it's been a pleasure working for her, the Affordable Care Act uh, and the drug pricing bill that I worked on with Joe Grogan. Thank you. Joe? Uh, sure. So I am from upstate New York, a uh, rural area, also, uh, you know, like Wendell, and uh, ended up in Washington, D.C., working for the Republican Senatorial Committee out of college. Decided I hated Washington, D.C., and went to law school, and uh, was practicing in West Palm Beach, and found myself reading the Washington Post, the Washington Examiner, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal every day and not reading the Palm Beach Post. And I kind of started to think as my year was going on, I really don't like practicing law. I, I should go back to DC. And then September 11th happened and I quit that following Friday and moved to DC and was working for Health and Human Services by November. Worked seven, over seven, oh, about seven and a half years in the Bush administration on the President's Advisory Council for HIV and AIDS. Uh, was a special assistant to the FDA commissioner I'd started at the Administration for Children and Families. And then after the administration, I worked for Amgen and Gilead Sciences, uh, two great California pharmaceutical companies, and wasn't really looking to go back so much into, into government, but um, had the opportunity to go to the Office of Management and Budget and uh, be what's called the Associate Director for Health, which is an awesome job that I, I didn't think I'd ever get and then uh, and got it and then uh, became domestic policy advisor after two years in the West Wing. Thank you. So um, I, let's jump right in. Uh, and I want to talk with you about how we cross the political divide. Um, uh, there's really a public perception that this is the most polarized Congress in history. And it's easy to blame both your bosses, Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi. But actually, if you look at the academic literature, they've documented a trend that goes back about 40 years in terms of polarization. And I, I just was curious, have you, you've both been in Washington so long. Is this your perception? And how do we work across the aisle? And I'll open it up to both of you. I'll go for it. But so I, I think it has gotten uh, bad. I haven't been there as long as, as Wendell. So tw it's 20 <laughs> years plus a little bit, little bit of time before law school. But I think it's gotten nasty. But I think the way that it can change is the way that Wendell and I started working together, which is Wendell called me up one day. Um, Nancy Pelosi had taken, uh, taken over, was going to be Speaker of the House. And uh, Trump had been on the record in supporting drug pricing reform. I'd been on the record in the media. I'd put two big drug pricing proposals and reforms into the president's budget, uh, which is where you send all your policies up for the coming year. And 
the phone rings and it's Wendell and he says, look, uh, I think if we're gonna get a deal done, it's gonna be, we're gonna have to work together and that's how it started and I think if more people did that, um, we could make more progress. Uh, well, I agree with uh, Joe, and I think when I, since I started working in 1975 for the Agriculture Committee, things have really become more partisan. I mean, Dan Rostenkowski, who was chairman of Ways and Means, had lunch every two weeks with Bob Michael, uh, a congressman from Peoria who was the minority leader of the House at that time, and he strongly believed in getting things done on a bipartisan basis. But I think what has happened since then is you know the money in politics has grown enormously. We've had um, uh, cable channels that talk to uh, certain parts of the electorate, and the Inflation Reduction Act, of which the drug pricing was in, involved in, was the first bill where every Republican in the House and the Senate voted no, and every Democrat in both the House and the Senate voted yes. And I don't think that reflects well on the institution of Congress, but it is what it is. And I, you know, I, there, I also worked with uh, Speaker Boehner, uh, a staffer by the name of Charlotte Ivanchek, and we worked on a physician payment fix together, and we got that across the line. So I think if Congress is to work, and right now in the Senate you need 60 votes, except for a reconciliation bill, to get things done, so it requires um, bipartisanship, and I think bills written in the center of the political spectrum are probably, as a whole, better than ones at either extreme. And I, I just coming back to your experience with HR three, uh, which is the Lower Drug Costs Now Act. Uh, it was introduced in September of 2019, um, and one of its most impactful provisions was to allow the secretary of HHS, at that time, the authority to negotiate drug prices for up to 250 drugs. But what interested me was that Donald Trump tweeted, and I, this is the, probably the only time I've quoted a Donald Trump tweet, for those of you who know me. Uh, it's great to see Speaker Pelosi's bill today. Let's get it done in a bipartisan way. And right soon after that, we started impeachment hearings. So it shows you, you know, they, so my question is really, there was consensus that there were approaches that could be taken here uh, to address an issue that Americans really cared about, which in this case was high drug prices. And we can debate the, the elements of that, but really, it was the, my question is whether the staffers, there, there were some obvious places that we policies that would be opportunities for bipartisanship and they just get lost in the cacophony of the political noise that you were talking about. Well, let, let me just <laughs> read one other thing that Donald Trump said, and this was in the State of the Union on, uh, in 2019. He said, it is unacceptable that Americans pay vastly more than people in other countries for the exact same drugs often made in the exact same place. This is wrong, this is unfair, and together we will stop it, and we'll stop it fast. So that was uh, President Trump, and th th that is the truth. I mean, people in this country pay roughly four to five times what for the same drug that they do in Western Europe. And uh, our culture here is different. Um, and so there was, I thought, a real opportunity um, because again, at that time in 2019, anything that gets done by Congress has to be signed by the president. Our constitution demands that. And so, uh, and so I thought there was a process that we could get it done. Um, we didn't, um, but I, I thought there was a, a real, and the facts and the evidence are um, that Americans do pay more and, and drug negotiation. So one other factoid here, the drug in Medicare we spend the most money on in one year, 9.9 .9 billion um, for a blood thinner drug, Aquilius. Um, and you know the 250th drug, we spend about 200 million. So it's highly skewed. And again, you negotiate the drug prices of the top 100, 200 drugs, you have saved one, a lot of money. And CBO on the first bill we introduced, 
and I was bound and determined we were going to have, and the speaker demanded this, that you have outside validation on everything you do. And CBO said HR3 saved $500 billion over a 10-year window. And as a result of that, we got Democratic caucus. Yes, there were some that wanted to go further left, um, but we got kind of unanimous caucus uh, agreement uh, with, the, with the speaker's aid, and that's where we, and then we spent the money uh, to help the elderly get dental, vision, and hearing. Joe? <laughs> so I worked on both that tweet and the State of the Union in 2019. <laughs> so, um, and you know, the key thing in the tweet was uh, one bipartisanship. Now, Trump had campaigned on drug pricing reform, but Republicans did nothing the first two years. They didn't take him seriously. So Pelosi comes in and she, bam, they ram this thing through. Now, the bill on its face, Wendell, with all due respect, it's a terrible bill. HR3 was <laughs> terrible. But what they did was they put a marker out there and I, okay, we're off to the races. Now we can work in a bipartisan fashion on a compromise and get something done. And we were, we were working on that. I mean, McConnell's office was involved. Um, we were, there were plenty of discussions. I still believe that in, uh, you know, in, in January 2020, uh, well, let's go to February 2020, COVID starting, I was going into the Oval Office and Larry Kudlow just showed me the uh, GDP numbers, 3.4%. And we both looked at each other and said, Trump's gonna win re-election. 3.4% economic growth, there is no way. And my phone was, had started to ring from Democrat staffers and members who wanted to do a drug pricing deal. They thought Trump was gonna get reelected. This is their opportunity. But within a month, six weeks, COVID had overtaken everything. Now I, I, you know, I was three and a half years in the, in the Trump administration. I promised my wife two years, and I broke my word to her like three or four times, like, give me six more months. I had said, the State of the Union in 2020, I'll leave after that, because I had a bunch of policies that we were working on, and I was gonna work on that. And also, the State of the Union's a blast to go to, but we negotiated the 2019 omnibus bill, and there were a number of provisions that Wendell and I worked on. Um, that were productive, I think, and good for, for the American public. But part of that, of that agreement, and we were gonna work on drug pricing and surprise billing by Memorial Day weekend of 2020. And so I came home, uh, I was at Camp David that weekend negotiating those provisions, and uh, came home and told my wife, I gotta stay till Memorial Day. And she looked at me and said, dude, you're leaving Memorial Day or I'm gonna kill you. And that, <laughs> that was kind of the, the deal, but I do think um, the, the Democrats threw energy into the system that would have allowed a, in my opinion, a better bipartisan bill. I, I know the I, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is, is better than HR3, but in my opinion, um, uh, it's, not, it's not ideal. Right. Let me just say one other thing. I think drug companies do wonderful things. There was a drug, a spinal muscular dystrophy, uh, atrophy, and 400 babies are born in this country each year out of roughly 3.6 a million babies. And they died by age two because of this affliction, the disease. And now we have a drug that we think will give those babies life, normal life expectancy. So, and that drug costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if it wasn't for the concept of insurance, no family could afford it. So again, I'm not against drug companies or what they do, but the fact is they overcharge and they do other things that uh, keep their monopoly running. They tweak it a little bit and get another patent, et cetera. And there is no doubt Americans pay more for health insurance, uh, for drugs here than in Western Europe. And there's no reason that should exist. And we'll see, HR3 is not, a version of HR3 is gonna get implemented here and you can judge for yourself whether it's as bad a bill as Joe <laughs> thinks it is. So you can see there are real questions, but there's substantive policy differences. And I, just to put a plug in for the Schaefer Center, which is here at Price, 
Uh, we do a lot of work on what we think will be the innovation effects here. And there is no doubt that gene therapy is an incredible opportunity for curing disease. The question is at what price? But we're not, I don't want to go too deeply into that because we have another event tomorrow where we're going to talk about that. But I, so I want to go to some other issues, which is um, uh, the federal budget. And this really reflects preferences of Americans in a fundamental way. Uh, and also federal debt. Uh, and in the United States, federal debt is at $30 trillion. And is $30 trillion a lot or a little? Well, one way to look at that is a fraction of our national income. And it turns out federal debt is now around 125% of GDP. Uh, we last saw that level in 1946, which is following a depression and World War II. So when real interest rates were zero, as they were just a few years ago, borrowing money seemed to make sense. Why not invest, especially if you're going to do things like invest in infrastructure? But now real interest rates are rising. They're up to 2%. And so I want to ask you, you know, I was on some panels. It was a big issue for a while, the federal debt. And then when interest rates uh, fell, uh, it became we can borrow indefinitely. Are you, is this something we should be worried about? And if it is something we should be worried about, is the solution higher taxes, lower spending, and who should be bearing the burden in all these cases? And so, Joe, we'll start with you. And yeah, I mean, look, I, I, at OMB, I was responsible for 1.2 trillion of, of domestic spending at uh, <laughs> that time and writing the budget to how to bend the cost curve down. And we would have all the debates about how to, how to, how to do that. Um, I think people should be worried about it. I mean, when you put that into context of World War II, uh, who's obviously spending that amount of money to, to fight psychotic totalitarian lunatics in Japan and Germany is well worth the price. But what's the emergency that we're living with right now that's so desperate that we're at this level of debt to GDP? Um, I, 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 you know, we can get away with this for a while and then suddenly we're gonna wake up and we're gonna realize we did it, made a catastrophic mistake here. Um, because there's no way it's sustainable. We are the nation's reserve currency right now. We all the benefit world. from that. The world. Uh, excuse me, the world's reserve cur currency, excuse me. And, but we can't keep spending like this and expect it's, it's gonna remain this way indefinitely. And frankly, we've gotten lucky in that Europe and, and Asia is still somewhat of a mess and is <laughs> uh, catastrophic some of the mistakes that we're making, they're making wor worse mistakes. But it will catch up to us. The time to do it is now when we're not in a crisis because when we do have a crisis, these decisions, are, our latitude and how to address them are going to get very constricted. Yeah. Well, I'll agree with Joe that our debt is too high and that we ought to be worried about the deficit. Um, but I'll look at the two singular bills. The Trump tax cut was not paid for. It lowered taxes significantly in 2017, and a lot of those tax cuts were at the very top of the income distribution. On the other hand, the singular achievement of the speaker, and I think she would agree with me, it was the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act, which basically allows all Americans now to be insured, have health insurance, uh, was completely paid for as certified by the Congressional Budget Office. So, I would argue uh, the Republicans talk a good game and say, yes, they want a balanced budget and they want to do it all on the spending side. Uh, and the Democrats have really uh, stuck to our guns and, and our major bills are paid for. The speaker is a strong believer in pay as you go it's, and the caucus. It's a, one of the rules of the House that legislation has to be paid for. So. Uh, and I think we've got to do much more in that arena. Joe, did you want to respond to that? <laughs> well, look, he's right. You know, Republicans frequently don't, you know, they, they'll walk a good, uh, they'll talk a good talk, but not walk it. Right. Um, but the, I disagree. I mean, the ACA had a lot of savings in it that never materialized. 
Um, as a matter of fact, CBO scoring of Medicare Part D was wildly off. Um, I thought it would be much more expensive because they never, they never do a very good job of uh, uh, figuring out what competition and innovation will do and how that's going to unfold in a dynamic marketplace. And they overestimated the costs of the, of the Trump tax cuts, and we had tremendous uh, economic uh, growth during that period. Remember, when the Obama administration left, the CBO and the Obama administration projected that we would never get above 2% uh, GDP growth again. And Trump was cranking out three plus regularly until COVID hit. So um, I, I'm a skeptic of the Congressional Budget Office. They've made plenty of mistakes. And um, you know, I don't think de giving the government more power over the economy gets us to, to the economic growth levels that we need in order to get our jet debt to GDP ratios back in line. Can I make just another comment? And that is where you all come in. And that is um, for a democracy to work, it requires an informed citizenry. And one of the issues that we had in the Affordable Care Act is uh, the Republicans charged we were raiding Medicare to pay for benefits, health benefits for the low income. Now, that was not the truth. The truth is, you know, there's a Medicare benefit side, which we did not touch. And then there's uh, things we pay for Medicare. And what we said to uh, health companies, uh, insurance companies and providers, we're giving you 30 million more people who are now insured, not uninsured, and they're gonna pay. And so we, we lowered hospital uh, reimbursement from Medicare and the Republicans charged, and I think they won that message war because the House, the De House Democrats lost 63 seats in the 1910 election and of a lot of it was tied, even though ARP and the elderly groups also believed in the Affordable Care Act, that lie really um, turned a lot of voters off and it was one of the contributing factors um, to that election. So messaging is important, but you, the public, are gonna really have to un, uh, figure out you know, who's telling the truth and why and it's your votes that ultimately count. So I, I, I do want to uh, go ahead, Jeff. Well, just say, I, I think it goes, well, just talk about this ideologically for a second. It go, when should the government get involved in healthcare? In my mind, it's when people can't afford it, Medicaid, and when, for, for whatever reason, they can't be insured. So that's disproportionately, obviously, seniors. So you have Medicaid and you have Medicare. And this is where we should be prioritizing and not in the broad swath in between. <coughs> Um, we are dumping tons of money in direct payments to health insurance companies who have profited tremendously since the Affordable Care Act has, was put in place. At the same time, we have, we have squelched innovation on the reimbursement and coverage side. So for instance, you can't develop, you can't innovate on the payment side, you can't innovate on the insurance side because you have this massive uh, regulatory structure at HHS saying, oh no, you can't. You can't develop a health insurance policy. I talked to a company one time that right before the ACA passed, they were going to develop a health insurance policy for runners and people who were extreme athletes. So they'd get more orthopedic care, they would get less coverage for other, other things. Can't do that. Maybe that would have failed. Maybe it would have been fine. Now the Democrats are, are, are freaking out over something called short-term limited duration insurance, which they call junk, junk insurance. I know people who, who have bought it who are not idiots they, for whatever family circumstances they have. And I've been uninsured. Uh, I was a ski bum in Lake Tahoe when I graduated college. I went uninsured. That's going to win over the audience. <laughs> that well, you got to do it every once in a while. Um, so I'm not unsympathetic <laughs> to the argument, but I should have more options and my family should have more options. And the government shouldn't be telling me that, that I can only buy the type of insurance that they want me to buy, which is wildly overinflated in large part due to the due to the um, structure of the Affordable Care Act. And this goes back to the earlier conversation. Medicare is going to face a crisis in reimbursement. And do we want our seniors to be taken care of or not? I don't see how uh, we can continue to dump the levels of, of resources into uh, not just Medicaid, but Medicare and the broad swath in the middle. 
Well, I think it was Ben Bernanke who once said the federal government is a health insurer with a navy. <laughs> so <laughs> pointing out how much we spend on health care. But I, I do want to talk about, because uh, Wendell made the point, and I think it's right, in some ways our social safety net has frayed. And he, this has been a common theme, I think, in your career, worrying about people who um, need help, services. And I want to talk, I know we have uh, Professor Tome's class here, and, and, and I want to talk about California so that it's, it's uh, one of the ways we've dealt with this in California is to tax the rich, to pay for things we like. So in 2005, we passed uh, the millionaire's tax, and that's generated over $20 billion in revenue. And Professor Tome recently estimated that this tax prevented maybe 6,000 suicides because better mental health care. So if you do some basic math, $20 billion divided by 6,000, uh, you get to something like 3.3 million per life saved, which interestingly is not dissimilar from the cost of some of those gene therapies that you were talking about, Wendell. So economists typically say that that's a good value because Joe, from your OMB days, you know that the value of a statistic, a life is, we do put numbers on that and it's somewhere in the range of seven to $12 million. So. The question becomes, you know, is this good policy to tax the rich uh, in California in order to save lives? Is it the responsibility of the people who are using these services to pay, bear some cost of this? Or is it the responsibility of those of us who've been more fortunate? Uh, and I'd like to hear your views, and we'll start with you, Wendell. Well. I haven't read the study, but I generally agree with the conclusions uh, of, of it. Yes, we should make sure every American has access to health insurance, and I think um, we need a very progressive taxation system to make that all happen. I mean, I would say the mental health crisis in this country right now is just uh, phenomenal, partly due to the pandemic, the deaths of despair, suicides, drug-related deaths, et cetera, and, the, and violence. I mean. Look at all the things, the three Virginia football players, a Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia, the Idaho. I mean, it's horrible. And we need to do something about uh, that. And, um, and I mean, that's another whole issue of gun violence and what we do about it. But there's no doubt. I mean, the other big issue we have in our health system right now is workforce. I mean, we're going to need many more of you to be involved in providing care, and uh, when I, as kind of a leading member of the baby boom generation born <laughs> in 1946, when we get to 85 and 90, uh, home health care, nursing home care, and, and the like, um, uh, the needs of this country, are, and I think government has to bear a burden of how we take care of those problems. If you come to Los Angeles, we'll take care of you. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Uh, we, Not you, Joe. Yeah, well, uh, the, so we clearly have a mental health crisis, and this was something we were working on even before the pandemic hit and made everything far worse. Uh, and there is a tie-in between homelessness and violence um, and quality of life issues. So I, I also haven't read the study, but look, we're all benefited when our streets are not populated by people in crisis who obviously need to be stabilized somehow and get mental health treatment. Um, it's not just a, a connection with, with the violent out, uh, eruptions that frequently um, lead to loss of life, but it's also qu it's quality of life issues. Um, but I, I, this is one of the things I disagree with Wendell about. Like, why weren't we focusing on the acute mental health crisis in this country instead of, say, the Affordable Care Act or drug pricing reform right now, when we're going to need a lot of uh, drugs to treat this, this crisis that we've got. Um, I'd, I would have been perfectly willing to repurpose uh, money for institutions to treat people with, with mental disease. And all, all Americans, all Americans, frankly, I don't know a family who isn't affected by it in some way, that has a family member a loved one who's, who doesn't go through some type of, or personally, people have you know, breakdowns and anxiety of some level 
um, or a family member maybe who's got schizophrenia. So this would be an area that uh, absolutely this country has done a terrible job of, of addressing in the past few decades and we need to fundamentally rethink it and money needs to be spent. Um, and we need to be looking at people who are going through crisis with compassion, get them the help they need. Frequently that's gonna be institutionalization for some period of time and it, it will cost money. I would be worried about the the surcharge if it's just redirected to another purpose. Frequently, a lot of these surcharges, are they say they're going to be for one thing, like the, the tolls on, on the highways on the East Coast. They say that's going to be just for the highway. They never go away. The highway's paid off. You still have to pay the toll. It's the same way with a lot of these taxes that go into, the, the, that go into effect. They never go away. So um, I just want to point out that we have freeways, not highways in California, although now we're tolling. But you're right that the lottery, for example, the California lottery allocates the money towards education, but it turns out that just crowded out something right. else. And right. So. But let me respond to Joe. I mean, I don't think there's a choice between the Affordable Care Act and whether we solve our mental health crisis. I mean, that's a false dichotomy. I mean, most of the people that became insured as a result of the ACA were below 200% of poverty, the vast number of them. And what amazes me is we still have now 11 states, South Dakota, I think, just did a referendum that still haven't done the Medicaid expansion that would have provided, made sure all people below poverty in those states have access to health insurance, et cetera. And uh, I remember telling the Pelosi when that Supreme Court decision came down uh, that, you know, don't worry, you know, we have 100% reimbursement for three years and then it went to 95 and then it was a 90-10, you know, and Orrin Hatch, who was then chairman of the Finance Committee of Republican from Utah, agreed with me. And, and much to my amazement, we still have 11 states that I think are still making a very dumb decision so that when people go to the hospital and they're uninsured, that hospital has to provide care. It's a federal law. But the hospital doesn't get reimbursed. Uh, and so... I just, to me, there's something fundamentally wrong about that situation. And again, if all states did it, and one of the things we were trying to get done, the speaker was trying to get done, was making sure all states expanded Medicaid. And we would have done that by just making those people who should have been Medicaid eligible, eligible for the um, Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And I, again, I think we need to do both. We need to get all people insured and we need to take care of our mental health crisis. But I would, you just admitted you know, the fundamental critique against the Affordable Care Act that the majority of the coverage gains were in the Medicaid population. Right. Medicaid expansion is one issue. Blowing up the insurance market is something else. And you, you, talk, you promised you'd bring costs down and people would be able to bring, uh, uh, choose their doctor. Neither one of those has panned out. Costs have not come down. Subsidies have gone way up. But costs have, have skyrocketed since the ACA was put into place. And frankly, the, the insurance company's profits has gone through the roof. Why? Because you're subsidizing uh, treatment coverage that often isn't necessary. So uh, back to my original point, we should be concentrating on those people who really need help. The poor, mental health crisis would be, be a great example, and seniors who can't be insured. Kids who have genetic conditions that uh, are incredibly diff, uh, expensive to treat, and you have small employers who their their insurance uh, costs go through the roof because they have one employee with two kids. They both have a genetic condition that costs a million dollars a year to treat. That's a, that's something that should be addressed, not going out for everybody that frequently doesn't need insurance to the level that you have mandated it. And I would just say, I think that it was misdirected attention. Yeah, there's so many things that Joe says that I need responding to, but uh, what can I say? But, You're uh, gonna get the last <laughs> word on this one, and but I'm gonna keep I, I want a, a raise of hands. How many of you are insured? And actually, 18, uh, yeah, 18 to 24 year olds was one of the highest uninsured groups prior to the ACA. So how many of you now have insurance because you're still getting it from your parents' employment? Uh, I rest my case, Joe. That, yeah, that <laughs> part everyone supported. Yeah, that I'll wait, I'll wait. I, well, I just got to say this. One, I think they would have needed to be insured as students here at USC regardless of that profession. Yeah. So uh, you shouldn't take credit for the fact that the same answer would have been given 10 years <laughs> I ago. I said Wendell was going to get the last word, but Joe kind of got it. 
I, I, I want to I move on, uh, but uh, I do want to say, actually, one thing I, I, that dismayed me the, at the time of the ACA, I got invited by the New York Times to write a piece, and I said, you know, if it's not going to improve health, why are we expanding coverage? And it turns out that Medicaid, if you look at the effects of the Medicaid expansion on health, it has decidedly mixed results. And I'll just say it's a disappointment. It certainly in the vulnerable populations, you see a big effect, mm -hmm. people with chronic disease. But overall, it's remarkably modest. But maybe that's uh, the I ha We're getting some great questions. Uh, over the transoms, so uh, they don't say that anymore, do they? Uh, over Zoom, Zoom Docs or something? Okay, uh, so I'd like to get your response to this. Uh, it seems like the, and I'm gonna read, it seems like the electorate is frustrated with part partisanship and people feel their vote is meaningless if Congress refuses to cooperate. And you said some numbers. Uh, and gave some examples. Is this by design? Members of Congress might be afraid of the bad optics if they are caught collaborating with the enemy. And do you believe social media and fake news have caused irreparable harm in that regard? Would either of you like to? Yeah, I mean, look, I, it's, it's a different environment than when I got there 20 years ago, certainly than when uh, Wendell was there. I do think you get penalize that th th those beginning conversations when you're starting to work on trying to figure out whether or not you can work together on a specific issue if they occur in the public domain you uh, you frequently have a media personality which will seize upon that and blow it up before it gets out of the of the gate and you need to you need to be working and collaborating on issues and that takes time I mean one, one notable example, though, is criminal justice reform that we were talking about before. Hakeem Jeffries is going to be the new Demo Democratic leader. Um, I don't know when if you want to talk about that, but that, you know, Trump leaned in on criminal justice reform. There were a lot of skeptical Republicans, but uh, Democrats and, and a number of Republicans were able to work with him on that. No, I totally agree, and I can understand the public's frustration. Um, when they see Congress as partisan as um, we are right now. And, and I do think, as I said, you know, a lot of that is the money. I mean, you think about you raise millions of dollars now in these elections, and you've got to beat an opponent of the other party, and then you've got to come to Washington, basically, and work with the other party. Uh, but it was done in the past. I mean, some of our major legislation have been done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, the Social Security Act, uh, and the like. And I think, I don't know how we get back to a less partisan situation. I mean, I think the money, maybe uh, something has to be done about that. Um, and um, so it, it's a complicated question of how, but I do think America does want some of these problems solved. Mm -hmm. And we do have very big ideological splits. I mean, see it in gun violence. I mean, America, uh, you know, the Democrats want um, uh, checks um, when you buy a gun. They want the assault weapons taken out. And we had assault weapon ban for a while. And, and, uh, um, and, and some of it is very ideological. I mean, the Second Amendment, the Republicans will say we can't do anything to regulate um, guns. Um, but I, I do think um, it's very important that we do get bipartisanship back and, and we work on these problems, mental health, as Democrats and Republicans and try to do something about um, that. And, and I think if it doesn't happen, um, voters are going to pu punish the, the party that they think has the responsibility has the responsibility for not trying to work with the other side yeah and I, I I mean I will say we tend to focus on the divisions they get a lot of attention but there have been these notable successes where there's agreement another example of an area 
where I think everyone agrees we have a problem are opiates and fentanyl and what's happening. You know, and we can argue over the solutions, but there are some clear steps we might take and, you know, areas like cannabis policy and the like, and, uh, but it's too much to go into now. So uh, Let me I just say one other one yeah. that affects this state a lot is the immigration. Yeah. reaching a solution on immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a part of me that says, uh, this country is gonna need a workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, um, anyway, I just- Don't you I, think that if we got people together in private and no one got labeled and talked about immigration, you could come up with, uh, there's just so much, it's a political football on both sides. <laughs> But that, again, staffers working together could come up with it. And I think George Bush kind of made, was doing that uh, at, and got very close. I mean, the during... speaker talks about the Ronald Reagan immigration bill, that, um, et cetera. So amnesty, I, amnesty, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. It's not, a, it's not just immigrant. I think there are tons of issues that could be worked out privately yeah. <laughs> and soberly. You know, there's a number of them that could be, that could be worked out in that fashion. And the question, so this comes back to, um, uh, and this will be our last question for the online audience. Uh, it comes back to how do we make that happen? Um, and is it just an informed voter? We have, need voters to be more informed and engaged, or is it that we gotta get money out of politics or what? Well, I don't, I don't agree that it's the money in politics necessarily. Um, but I do think, I do think, yeah. Everybody has to do what they can do, right? And whether you're in the private sector, or you're a citizen. To Wendell's point, you have to be, you have to make the effort to get informed, and just as importantly, you have to make the effort to get involved. Depending on how much time you can devote at any period in your life, uh, we have a lot of people who don't vote in this country. We have a lot of people who don't take the time to educate themselves on the issues, but I think showing up, uh, to your point, with people of other political persuasions and the school board meetings and the local political meetings and frankly on big issues affecting your state and locality um, are, is really important. I think you need to get citizens involved in this and, um, and be more active. I think that, in my opinion, that's the way to do it and cut everybody some slack when you get a call from the the speaker's incoming policy guru, you have a conversation instead of hanging up and say, no, there's no way Trump's gonna want me working with you. Um, you know, you have to talk to people on the other side of the aisle and try to move the ball forward. Yeah, and there were some people on the, in the Democratic caucus that were not happy <laughs> with yours truly uh, <laughs> about some of that. But I mean, I, I again, I think, um, you know, the, the feeling I got from the speaker is she wanted things done, and um, that was the end result, and, and uh, we did get it done, and now you'll see in a couple years you can make a judgment about how well it's going to work out and how well negotiation, I mean, there's other parts to it. It was negotiation. It was also saying um, drug prices couldn't increase faster than inflation, um, and we also put a $2,000 limit in the Part D program, and we did a few other minor things, but there were actually three major parts to the bill. Sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, we're gonna close the online portion. We'll stay, I want them to address some of the questions you see the audience submitted in advance. But I just wanna thank both of you for your service. I uh, know both of you, Joe, I forgot to mention that you were a non-resident senior fellow in the Schaefer Center. Um, Wendell, we'd like you to join us when you, if, should you happen to end up leaving. Uh, and you both have been tremendous public servants. You have uh, acted ethically and responsibly, and we thank you for that, so. Thank you.